welcome to my first time lapse video. So, in this video, I'm going to be recreating the Great Wave using 1000 origami paper cranes. Some fun facts about the project the pencil case I'm using is inspired by the Netflix movie To All the Boys I've Loved Before. I'm a huge fan of snail mail and handwritten letters. And right now, the US Post Office has Star Wars themed forever stamps. So please go out and support your local post office. Back to the paper cranes project. I realized my passion for graphic design in high school. There was an art class that I took where we would make large scale posters. Most of them would be for birthdays for fellow students, but I was also able to work on a lot of the commissions for our local community. Speaking of local and supporting the community, all of the origami used was bought from Sakura Gifts. It's located on 10th Street in my hometown of Sacramento, California. Side note, if you visit during the summer, the shop is located next to Osaka-ya, which is a great place to get shaved ice. You could even add a scoop of ice cream. The Great Wave was originally on a woodblock print created by Katsushika Hokusai in the 1830s. The original title is Under the Wave of Kanagawa in Japanese, Kanagawa Okinami Ura. It's also the inspiration for my first tattoo, which I will comment on later on in the video. So as you can see, I'm currently working on the boat detailing for the design. I really had no idea how I was going to arrange any of these cranes, which is why you will see I make two attempts at this design. The first is me just piecing them all together and arranging them how I wanted it to make sure that I could fit all 1000 onto the frame. And then the second half of the video is me gluing them individually one by one. During my first attempt, I also struggled with knowing what to do with those colored paper cranes. I had a smaller portion of colored versus the silver, but it ended up working out because I used them for the background. So in the bottom left hand corner, you can kind of peep my wave tattoo. Funny stories about that. So the first is my grandma used to call me Yakuza which is Japanese for gangster because she thought that only gangsters get tattoos. Another short story is I got the tattoo when I was 19 and on my 20th birthday, I woke up to the news that a giant tsunami wave had devastated Japan and a family member later that day made a joke and said that that's what I get for getting a tattoo. I cause natural disasters. I also want to take a moment to give a quick shout out to the artist behind my super sick Star Wars sleeve that you see right there. That's Madi at Nice Tattoo. Oh, you can also see my wave tattoo. I remember thinking that when I got it, it was going to be my one and only tattoo. <laughs> so now we've come to the part of the video where I start gluing down each and every crane. I kind of got upset that I had to start all over again, but I wanted to make sure that I had enough cranes to finish the entire project. So here I go, gluing each one down. Back to the story of my first tattoo. I was 19, living at home with my parents, and the day I got my tattoo, I remember telling my parents that I was thinking about getting a tattoo. And when they found out that I got one, they were pretty upset, um, but now they've come to understand that it means so, so much to me. The reason I chose the tattoo was because I wanted something that would help me identify with my heritage, which is full Japanese American, but I didn't want a commonly used Japanese style tattoo. And I've seen a lot of koi fish, I've seen a lot of cherry blossoms, I've seen a lot of kanji used. I believe there is a difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation, but just in light of everything going on in America right now, I want to address the AAPI community. 
the month of May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I have to be honest, while doing this project, learning about Japanese culture felt foreign to me. And I can only speak about my personal experience, but my childhood was very assimilated. I didn't grow up speaking Japanese or hearing Japanese spoke around the house. I didn't grow up eating a lot of Japanese food or participating in Japanese cultural events or knowing a lot of Japanese history. And as I grew older, I realized it was the result of my grandparents having their childhood spent in internment camps. They were forced to give up their culture and their identity simply because they looked like the enemy. And sadly, people are still choosing to uphold that racist mentality. The rise in hate crimes and attacks against Asian Americans is completely unacceptable. And it is very disheartening to see attacks against elderly, which are even more vulnerable. And it is frustrating seeing how much Japanese culture has influenced popular culture. For example, anime. I remember growing up, it was not that popular, which is why I didn't grow up watching animes. And it's strange to see how much it has overtaken pop culture. You see it in clothing, you see it on marketing, you hear it in songs. It's everywhere. Everyone loves anime. Another example is Star Wars. A lot of people may not know that Darth Vader's helmet is designed after a samurai's helmet. And if you look at the Star Wars universe, you will find so many influences from Japanese culture. George Lucas loves his Japanese culture. So if you're a Star Wars fan, you better recognize there would be no Star Wars without Japanese culture. And here's a little film trivia. The movie Magnificent Seven starring Denzel Washington and Chris Pratt is a remake of a Western, The Magnificent Seven, which is actually an adaptation from the Japanese film Seven Samurai. So yes, it does hurt thinking that sometimes your culture is only used for entertainment's sake or that the way you look is over-sexualized or over-fetishized or that you're just a model minority myth. If you're interested in the model minority myth, there is one scene in the movie Get Out by Jordan Peele that shows a very interesting dynamic. And personally, I feel torn between wanting to celebrate those moments of where there is more Asian representation in movies and TV, but then also seeing the rise in attacks against Asians in the news. When I see the news, I just stop and think, that could be my grandparents. They could be shot, they could be killed, they could be stabbed, they could be attacked, and it breaks my heart. Especially because one of my grandparents is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a brain disease linked to dementia and memory loss. And I dread the day that they won't be able to remember their lives and their history and the stories that they can pass down. So to show my gratitude and appreciation and also to gift a very special wish this paper crane project is going to be gifted to my grandparent. And I can't wait to give it to them. I hope that they like it. Japanese legend says that if a person folds 1,000 paper cranes, they are granted one special wish. I first heard of this legend when I read Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes when I was a young girl. Sadako Sasaki was a real Japanese girl who developed leukemia after being exposed to the radiation from the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. 
There is a monument in her honor to mourn her and the children who were killed by the atom bomb. It's located in Hiroshima Peace Park. After doing some research for the project, I found that the book was not quite the same as Sadako's real life. Masahiro Sasaki is Sadako's Onichan, or older brother. In his words, Sadako continued to fold cranes day after day to wish on them without any lament or resentment. Furthermore, she kept folding cranes not for herself, but for her family. This is what I want to share with you all, the compassionate heart. One compassionate heart can create small peace around you. Small peace can then lead big peace in the end. Sadako taught us how important it is to have compassionate heart for her dear life. I believe this compassionate heart is the thing each of us need to keep in our minds, and folding paper cranes can be the first step to connect our hearts together. So here I am adding the last bit of cranes to the project. I wanted to save some for small detailing just to add those little touches at the end. And then I pressed everything down to make sure that it was going to stay on there. And then after that, I gave it a glance and I was like, you know what it needs? Some paint. I am in no way a painter or a Bob Ross in any way, but I thought it would add some nice little dimensions. So after sketching out the design, arranging the cranes, taking them off, and then gluing them back on one by one, it took me a total of 5 hours and 39 minutes. That's how much footage I condensed into this 16 minute video. Not to mention the hours upon hours, days upon days that I spent folding each and every one of these 1,000 paper cranes. I hope that this piece can serve as a symbol of hope and of compassion and that it is important to tell our stories and learn our history and respect those who came before us. So here it is, the final result. I just added a little bit more paint to make the wave pop out, but I'm really happy with it. Thanks for watching.